Hi, I'm Michelle Malik and you're watching in this special. Dozens of Rohingya refugees, after spending weeks at sea, landed on the coast of southern Bangladesh on Saturday. They have since then, since then been sent to the remote island of Bashanchar by Bangladeshi authorities. According to Bangladesh's own officials, this step was necessary to protect the already overcrowded refugee camps of Cox's Bazar from a COVID-19 outbreak. But human rights groups say that the island is not fit for habitation. Let's take a closer look at this developing story. Joining us today is Mr. Niswin, who's a co-founder of Free Rohingya Coalition. He joins us from Frankfurt. Also joining us today from Dhaka is Mr. Asif Munir, who's a developmental professional, rights activist, and a cultural activist in Bangladesh. Uh, thank you both for joining us and welcome to the show. Mr. Asif Munir, I I'd like to begin with you. Now, what do we know so far about the individuals who landed on Bangladesh's shores? How many were there? And since when have they be tr been transferred to this island? Um, as far as uh, you mentioned that uh, it's a developing story, I think in the last few days there were uh, about 400 who were uh, rescued and the latest um, are about, uh, you know, around 30. Uh, the idea is that uh, these people were actually in the Bangladesh camps and they were uh, in the hands of human smugglers and traffickers uh, and the intention was to go to Malaysia. And we have seen in the last uh, few weeks uh, that uh, neither Malaysia or other neighboring states were ready to accept uh, these people because mainly of the coronavirus threat. Uh, so eventually they came back towards the Bangladesh shores and the Bangladesh authorities accepted them. But uh, in light of the uh, possibility of the spread of coronavirus, the issue that you mentioned about the Pashantar Island, uh, that is uh, that was still not being used. It's still um, uh, not for a regular use, but especially for the isolation, for the quarantine uh, of the, uh, for another two weeks. It's mainly because of that. It has been ready for some time, but of course there are issues of uh, if there, it's actually a livable condition or not. But it's mainly for the isolation that's uh, uh, being taken in the last uh, uh, 48 hours or so. Right. And now, they were first received by the Bangladeshi authorities. Were they immediately transferred to the island? Uh, no. They were in the hands of the uh, border guards and the local authorities uh, and eventually transferred, uh, as far as uh, we know. But how uh, that has not been really disclosed, How may, uh, if all of them have been transferred or if, uh, you know, uh, it's being in the process. But it's definitely in the hands of the authorities. Uh, definitely, they were in touch with UNHCR, uh, but it's the Bangladesh government who is taking charge of this. Right, but it seems like since we don't know for sure whether this island is livable or not, taking this move, even if it's just for uh, quarantine, seems a bit extreme. Would you agree with that? Uh, yes, uh, but it's also very difficult that even at the moment, uh, because the camps are very crowded and, you know, you have uh, footages showing that as well. Uh, if anybody has been infected while they were at sea or, you know, in touch with other people um, who were their traffickers, if they have anything, I mean, it's very difficult to contain that within the camps. Um at the moment, I think there's no other alternative that they could think of, but this may happen again. So the government needs to think whether uh, this is actually going to be a very temporary measure. They need to have proper facilities for uh, treatment, for uh, tests, and if in isolation is required, then you know any kind of food supplies and all of that needs to be considered. This is for a one-time thing at the moment, maybe all right, because the other alternatives are not really available. And Bangladesh is not really ready because you know that uh, the total uh, positive cases has been over 10,000 10, in Bangladesh. Forget about the camp areas. Right. So but the country is not really ready to face any kind of spread anywhere. Right, so right, it's kind of like a choice they have to make. Right, Mr. Stay with me. I'm going to jump to Le and talk to him a little about what is happening at sea so far, about who the Rohingya refugees are uh, in terms of who they are at this point in time when they're at sea. Why are they trying to leave Bangladesh? Why are they trying to go to 
Malaysia and what is happening with those that are still back home in Myanmar. Um, Neelan, how do you see this situation? Well, these people uh, came to show off their Bangladesh uh, last month and this month. <clears throat> They all left from the, as far as I know, they all left from the Bangladeshi camp. Uh, in February, they were in the sea for more than two months and they were pushed, uh, turned away by the Malaysian authority. Uh, and also, I had the, the Thai authority also, they have turned them away. And finally, uh, they came back to Bangladesh. And last month, uh, I think uh, in the second week of last month, about 400 uh, were. Uh, allowed to disembark in, in in Bangladesh, and they were quarantined uh, uh, nearby the camp. And but just uh, on Saturday, about uh, forty people were came to the show of the Technaf, and they were uh, taken to the this uh, island, uh, remote island, Barsanchar. Uh, about twenty nine uh, six women and the uh, uh, twelve, ch including. Six women and their 12 children were taken to the bus and char. Uh, even this, the little amount now, the government has changed the pol policy to send them to the uh, bus and char. So, th why these people flee fleeing to uh, Malaysia is, you know, that uh, there are the human trafficker uh, in the camp. And they came to the camp and, you know, they are exploiting them, you know, always giving them the uh, impression that, you know, you can travel to. Uh, Malaysia by vote, you know, you will get the job there. And some also uh, joining their family, like, you know, the wife and the children are joining their husband and father in Malaysia. This way, you know, uh, they, they are taking the, this risky journey to Malaysia. Because this is not the new for us. Uh, this has been happening since 2006 uh, from Myanmar. And uh, this the traffickers are a kind of network, you know. I don't know how they are close with the, the those people who have the authority to release them from the show to uh, to live for uh, Malaysia because you know this is the hundred of the people living from one area. You know, uh, it is not easy to live uh, uh, without the uh, acknowledgement of the local authority or the local guard there. You know, uh, Bangladesh has the strict policy to uh, stop the human trafficking. But the still, the people are living from there. So I'm really wondering, you know, how these people left from there. So back in Myanmar, the genocide is still ongoing. And the, nothing Mr. has uh, changed. Mr. Nele, just sorry to project here, but I want to put that question. Since you're saying in Myanmar, the genocide is still ongoing. In January 2020, when the ICJ instructed Myanmar to take steps to protect uh, the Rohingya Muslims within the borders... Do you see any positive developments since then? No. After the ICJ ruling in January, uh, now uh, in this month, uh, on I think 23rd, the, uh, both parties need to su uh, submit their finding. But the situation hasn't changed. The situation is getting worse day by day since then. You know, a few dozen Rohingya have been killed amid the fighting between the Arkan army and the Myanmar military Arkan army representing the Rakhine Buddhists in the area, you know. So their fighting is a, a daily basis going on. Uh, so Rohingya are getting killed and many have been displaced. So from Rakhine side also, there is a lot of casualty and the displacement as well. So the right. situation is uh, likely not going to change at all until, you know, the international community can take the uh, serious action against the Burmese right. government and the military. Right. Um, uh, just one uh, quick question before I jump back to uh, Mr. Munir here. Now, the UN has acknowledged that the Rohingya Muslims are the most persecuted minority in the world. Now, given this pandemic, given how things have been unfolding all across the world, how do you think they have been being dealt with uh, by those who need to give them asylum, by international organizations? You've discussed with us thoroughly about what is happening with them in Myanmar in general. But given this pandemic, do you see uh, there being greater assistance given to them? Because, you know, 
the condition in the camp, you can see uh, this is uh, the crowded camp with the dire situation, and you know uh, inside the camp there is no safety and the security, and also the, the uh, these human trafficker are exploiting them, and that there is internet shutdown, and the the, the refugee have no access to the uh, education, the healthcare also very limited. I am not blaming the Bangladesh government that they have already given us the land uh, for the uh, uh, sheltering uh, uh, sheltering more than a million there. So the the responsibility on the this UN organization and the international community to to develop the, their situation. And uh, in regard to the, this uh, uh, pandemic, uh, I had you know in the Kosas Bazar area there are more than three million. Uh, uh, population, uh, including the, this refugee community, there is no uh, ventilator nor the ICU bed there. Only the, the government right. has arranged the 1,000. Right. Uh, Mr. Uh, please stay with me. I want to jump back to uh, Mr. Munir and talk to him a little about what is happening on ground in terms of trying to contain this outbreak, especially when it comes to the refugee camps. Mr. Munir, you earlier stated that it is essential to quarantine those that are coming back from sea because if there is an outbreak, it would be disastrous for uh, a place where there is there is complete lack of uh, social distancing, very scarce resources. That's agreed upon. But we're hearing reports of those who are being housed in the island sneaking back into the camps because the conditions are so unlivable. Isn't that even more dangerous, that people have to sneak into the camps without being tested or uh, without there being any trace of them? Uh, that's very true. Having said that, the government did not find a good alternative in the camps. I know for sure that uh, in the last one month or so, the international community who are still active in Cox's Bazar, they have been uh, doing sort of um, information campaigns, uh, awareness about, you know, protective measures, hand wash, sort of social distancing inside the camp areas. Um, and also uh, preparing spaces that can be used for isolation. So yes, uh, at the moment, uh, the way they live in the camp areas, there's no uh, possibility of social distancing, but there have been preparations made. So the government needs to sort of investigate and agree with the UN agencies that yes, these can be used. And on the other hand, uh, you know, in terms of different testing kits and all of that, different UN agencies have provided with the, uh, that with the hospitals. Um, so I would say that the agencies are prepared, but yes, people who have been living there, they would naturally want to come back to their own sheds or uh, other kins that they have. So, uh, you know, forcibly isolating them will not really work. There needs to be some kind of uh, you know, discussion, negotiation, and common understanding that they understand why this isolation. And if the existing facilities for isolation are nearby the camps, which is ideal, and the UN agencies have been working on that. So that needs to be uh, sort of looked into, whether that can be used in the future for, or, uh, for if there is a spread. If there is a massive spread, that will not be adequate, of course. Uh, but at the moment, there have been some tests done. There has been possibility of infections, but so far uh, there has been, uh, at least among the camp areas, uh, not uh, any has been identified to have corona yet. Right. Um, uh, Mr. Asim Munir, I'm just going to go uh, to Mr. Neil Swin and ask him one last question. Uh, Mr. Neil Swin, as you see the situation developing and you see that there is mobilization, as Mr. Asif Munir is stating, on the global front, to provide greater assistance uh, to Bangladesh and protect the refugees. Do you think that's enough? And if not, what more needs to be done in your opinion? Yeah, this is not really enough because, you know, uh, as I've mentioned earlier, there are about um, more than 3 million uh, population in the area, in Kasas Bazar area, including the refugee community. So, so far I had, uh, there are about the 1,700 uh, isolation bed prepared by the government and the, yes, uh, these save the children and the other MSF have arranged some isolation bed in the KM. So those are not going to enough, you know. We, we, we don't know when this uh, disease will spread in the camp because already in the Costas Bazar area, once it spreads in, in the camp, 
uh, it will like you know the spread like wildfire fire inside the camp because there there is no possibility of the social distancing and but still you know they they know uh, some little about the hand washing and the other things but we cannot reach out them uh, uh, to send the me our message you know uh, for, for for this awareness because the internet shut down this is this is the the main problem we are facing we cannot reach them or, uh, to send our messages and also uh, that the camp is the very crowded area there is completely impossible for many other things so well, what we are seeing is you know uh, there is a lot of response needed from the international community uh, build the hospital not only for the i'm not only asking for the refugee community but also for the host community you know right so this way uh, that will be much easier to contain the virus if it's spread there. Right. Thank you so much, Mr. Nele, for joining us, taking out the time to talk to us. Uh, Mr. Asimuni, that is a very essential point. I mean, a country like Bangladesh that itself is trying to contain the virus within the host community, it is also supporting refugees additionally. You talk to us about how the UN is lending support, but do you think that is enough? Uh, definitely not, uh, because, you know, for the last few years, what has been done is kind of like making an annual plan, which is which is called the Joint Response Plan for the Rohingya community. And for the last two years, even for this year, it includes support for the host community as well. Now, when this plan was prepared back in December 2019, um, the pandemic was, of course, not planned or uh, foreseen at this scale. So definitely what had been planned was more like a regular response for throughout 2020. Now, that needs to be revised and updated. I, I know through different sources that the different UN agencies uh, have been looking at, uh, you know, diverting their existing programs and funding, but it needs to be a, a higher level discussion, even at the international level, whether at New York or Geneva for the UN and the international aid agencies to rethink for particularly for the Rohingya population, but also for any other refugee population, because the needs are slightly different for for the host community, for countries where uh, refugees are hosted. Right, definitely. Mr. Asim Munir, I just want to pick up some of the uh, words you've used so far with me in the conversation, which is uh, the United Nations is looking at possibilities. There are awareness campaigns. They have plans to develop facilities. Now, all of this seems like it's still in the pipeline. We have known that this pandemic is blowing over all over the world for quite some time now. Do you think that there is enough urgency on the part of the United Nations, which is perhaps the only organization that can be looked towards to help protect refugees at this point in time? See, this is completely a, a new territory for the world to respond to, respond to uh, the communities at different levels. Now, for instance, for the Rohingya community, uh, when this pandemic hit, there were a lot of international staff in Bangladesh, uh, international staff of the UN and other aid agencies. Many of them have actually left Bangladesh because of the risk of, that they themselves face uh, with uh, restrictions, lockdowns, the uh, field workers in the Rohingya camps have been restricted. Even then, so there are uh, you know some campaigns, some information awareness, but exactly, it's not enough because uh, you know the mechanisms are not in place. Uh, right. People are not there. Uh, the protective measures are not enough. Right. Yes, it's slow, uh, but I would say that it's not there. It's that's not true. It is there, but it's a difficult situation to address. It's right. easy to say that. It needs to move fast ahead, but it would be very difficult. Right. Uh, Mr. Asamunir, stay with also joined by Mr. Lyle Sunga, who's a human rights expert focusing on international human rights law. He joins us from Rome. Thank you so much, Mr. Sunga, for joining us. Welcome to the show. Uh, now, Professor Sunga, as we've been talking about all of this, and you might have heard the last bit of conversation with Mr. Munir here, that this is new territory even for the United uh, Nations. So for them to have that urgency that is expected of them is perhaps too much of a reach. But just seeing how they have been responding to the refugee crisis, to the migration crisis, not just before, uh, not just during this pandemic, but before it, do you feel like they have shown the urgency that is needed to match the enormity of the crisis uh, in the world? Well, the um, difficulty that I see is not so much uh, 
on UNHCR, uh, for example, itself, or the um, you know other uh, UN agencies, which are doing the maximum that they can with very limited resources. It's the st uh, states um, behind uh, the the United Nations that should be contributing more at this difficult time. And um, when we have this kind of um, crisis that has come up in the last couple of days, for example, of these 500 uh, people adrift at sea, um, and um, uh, various countries, uh, you know, say that uh, you know turn them back to, to sea, it's a slow death. And um, this is a lack of political will. COVID is being used a little bit as an excuse by by some states. So um, the difficulty is not so much on the part of international organizations, but um, at, at all, really, they're they're doing their best, and they have been doing their best so far. But it's the st uh, you know states that need to support this, and especially those that uh, have a um, responsibility for search and rescue under international customary law, and to make sure that people are not turned back uh, to uh, uh, places where they're going to. Uh, risk their right. their lives from uh, well-founded fear of persecution, which is the case of uh, Myanmar, obviously, who, which is the main uh, culpable here. Right. Professor Stonga, as you're saying that this is being used kind of as an excuse by con uh, countries not to live up to their humanitarian obligations, but the defense would be that these are the countries that have been hit the hardest by the pandemic. It is unrealistic to expect of them to keep up with these obligations of letting new people into their borders. How would you take that argument? Something that is quite rampant all across uh, Europe at this point in time, especially. Yeah, you know, I would just completely throw out that argument and I'll tell you why. It's because um, first we have to take care of people who are right now uh, starving and uh, dying of thirst. Then we'll sort out the logistical problems. Then we'll figure out the uh, the financial issues and who goes where, etc. But if there's people dying and they're being dumped off at sea, um, you know that's the urgent problem. They have to be taken care of. Then we'll sort out the financial and logistical things. But I, I mean, I get your point about which is a good one, uh, which is about COVID. But um, still, that you know, COVID measures have to be proportional. And they have to be relevant. I mean, um, there's a bunch of people who are at immediate risk of dying. They are dying. And then the COVID issue will be taken care of. So there has to be measures taken. There have to be, for example, the medical issue and uh, anti-contagion issues, et cetera, et cetera. So nobody's saying that, you know, everybody can, uh, each state has to allow everybody just to walk in. Uh, but they have to be rescued from sea. They have to be given safe haven, they have to be taken care of, and those that need uh, medical assistance, which are many, um, have to be taken care of. This is a basic humanitarian issue, and it's a, it's a human to human issue. So I wish that politicians would forget that they're politicians and think of themselves as if they were ever at risk, uh, they would uh, need that type of care. So it's, it's really a moral, ethical, and humanitarian issue, issue first, and the legal and financial stuff we'll figure out later in a way. Right. Right. Uh, um, Professor Sangha, I agree with you there that there is a need for greater empathy, but unfortunately that seems to be put on the back burner when we talk about law and policies, especially related to national, uh, to the territory of a nation. Now, when there are allegations and when, as we have been seeing, human traffickers are exploiting the situation, taking many of these refugees to these places, and that is also one of the defense that is used, that you have a right to deny certain people entrance into uh, your borders, especially do during a time like this. Is that another complexity that you see within this issue, or do you feel like that also is being used and is as an excuse? It's certainly a complexity, but the way of uh, addressing it, and it's not being addressed, um, is to say, well, uh, okay, let's turn a blind eye to it. You know, human smug, uh, smuggling and human traffickers, all these networks, there are arrangements in place for cooperation to stamp that problem out. And it's a very difficult issue, but, you know, there are measures that have been developed and cooperation agreements in place. So saying, well, you know what, we don't want to deal with this thing anymore because there's uh, this crisis or that crisis is extremely short-sighted because um, you're just going to get more of this problem later on unless... Uh, police cooperation and uh, maritime cooperation and, uh, you know, mutual cooperation uh, in criminal matters, which is what forms the basis for an effective response, 
continues on human trafficking. So if you find a problem, it's not there's no solution to say, well, we're going to ignore it, it's going to go away. No, actually, human traffickers get that message and they step up operations, more people are victimized, and you have a, right. a much worse problem uh, very in, in, the sh in the short and medium term. It happens very quickly. So uh, the, only, the only way, I'm afraid, is uh, there are difficult problems is to address them. Right. And, and uh, human trafficking, you're absolutely right, is one of those problems. Right. Mr. Asimunir, now we even uh, put up the developed nations as the benchmark when it comes to laws and humanitarian obligations and uh, democracy. But what do you think can these developed nations learn from a developing nation like Bangladesh, which has allowed refugees, which has welcomed refugees, especially when we look at the cases of uh, European nations, which have so blatantly closed their borders to those fleeing from the worst kinds of conflicts within Syria and the Middle East? Um, definitely. Uh, I think this is kind of like pointing a finger towards uh, Europe and, and even U.S. and the developing developed nations uh, in terms of where humanity and humanitarian um, issues need to uh, be dealt with upfront, rather than uh, you know other aspects of uh, border control, uh, security issues. Um, but th that's the double standard uh, and the world that we're living in. And even um, you know we have discussed before. I think you know your programs and, and other, other times that uh, there are still responses to the humanitarian aid for the last few years. If, if we talk about just the Rohingya people, but in terms of resolving human rights issues, uh, you know, uh, putting sort of uh, Myanmar uh, uh, kind of accountable, uh, that has again. You, you were talking about the international measures and, and the International Court of Jurists, where uh, Gambia. Again, part of the developing nations uh, and a member of the OIC had to take this up. This does not come from the Security Council at the UN. So, yes, we do see double standards, but that's global politics for you. Right. On that point, we're going to end segment here. Thank you so much, Mr. Asif Munir, for your time, Mr. Professor Laila Sunga, for your time. We're going to go for a short break, but when we come back, we take a look at how Yemen with healthcare infrastructure already on the brink of collapse, is bracing for a possible outbreak of COVID-19. Stay with us. Welcome back to the show. Yemen's medical community braces for an unspeakable crisis. With health infrastructure on the brink of collapse and more than 24 million people of the total popu population of 29 million needing humanitarian assistance. What would the outbreak do, do to the country? Let's discuss this further. Joining us for this conversation is Bushra Nasser, economic development expert and member of Yemen COVID-19 Consulting Group. She joins us from Stockholm. Also joining us today is Mr. Nabil Vasi, who's a human rights activist joining us from Thais. Thank you both for joining us and welcome to the show. Ms. Nasser, I'd like to begin with you. Now, the United Nations believes that COVID-19 might be rampant within Yemen, but it is going undetected. Do you share that fear? Yes, I do. Actually, there are some doctors and other people who have been uh, sending some alarms and some cases already, but there are some these cases, especially in Sana'a, uh, as I understood, uh, are not have not been uh, mentioned or declared yet by the government uh, or by the Houthis rebels in Sana'a. Uh, the, I understood that there will be a press release this uh, today by the Minister of Health in Sana'a or the uh, Houthis uh, uh, Minister of Health. So we are looking forward to, to hear what they're going to say. Right. Mr. Nabil Vasi, on the point, what is happening on the ground? Do you share that fear that the virus is actually much more widespread than it is being reported? What are you going to hear on the ground? They don't even have an actual test to test for the coronavirus itself. A majority of the, you know, coronavirus victims or patients are basically tested purely on diagnostics. The diagnostics are based on what symptoms? The symptoms of a coronavirus. Fever symptoms, runny nose, coughing, respiratory issues. This is what's based... This diagnostics of those symptoms is what basically allows doctors and medical physicians to write down this victim, this patient has COVID-19. Other than that, there's no actual authentic test for the virus itself. It's only based purely upon 
uh, symptoms of a patient. Right. So how can they test patients in Yemen? How, 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 how are they going to have the capability to test patients in Yemen if they don't even have the capability to test patients around the world globally? Right, when, Mr. Masi, when they're being tested and diagnosed with coronavirus based on symptoms only. Right. Only on symptoms, not Mr. on the virus itself. Right, so Mr. Masi, we can't even prove that there's actual... Right, Masi, from what I understand, you're saying that there is no testing, but the World Health Organization states that there are four uh, diagnostic testing stations where there is active testing going on. Is that actually the case? Do you actually see that happening? People being tested and then being seen as being positive after the tests and then going on from there onwards? Or is it just, as you're saying, symptoms coming in and people assuming that it's COVID-19? How, how, but how can you actually verify 100% decisively that it's COVID-19? How can you determine that? When basically 99.9% .9 of, the, of the cases of, of coronavirus have been diagnosed based purely on the symptoms, right? So how can you be able to distinguish All between right. coronavirus and the season flu? All right. Yeah? Or, or influenza or something like this. So, so how are they going to be able to do it in Yemen if they're not even doing it globally? You right. talked about Mr. Vasi, I take your point there. I'm going to jump back to uh, Ms. Bushra Nasser and talk to her about this as well. Now, we seem to be hearing that there is... Uh, efforts by the United Nations within Yemen to try to develop some form of testing to at least try to prop up certain systems to try to uh, train healthcare professionals. Is that actually happening from your knowledge? Or as Mr. Vasi has been stating that it is all up in the air, there's no actual groundwork? Yeah, this is a denial status that this is not helping the Ye Yemeni people and the Yemeni uh, uh, whoever is running the, the, the controlled areas to support in, in containing this. We have to support people to accept that there is a virus and they have to keep home and stay home and, and keep staying in the social distance. This is not happening in Yemen because of these denial messages. If I may uh, say that, yes, the WHO and the UN, uh, along with the government in 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 in, uh, uh, in the south and with the Houthi rebels, they are in close coordination in uh, providing PCR tests. And accordingly, these PCRs, as I understood, especially from Hadramaut and Adan, has positively uh, giving signs of positive uh, coronavirus. And I understood also that the. Um, that there is a, a yeah, yes, there is a collapsed health system. Yes, there is a fifty percent of the health infrastructure is destroyed, too, and and there is a, a, lacking the the qualified healthcare professionals. But there is a minimum understanding what is the virus and how this, the virus uh, is Ms. affecting Pusha, people. Nasser, just in defense of Mr. Nabil Basi, you stated that he is uh, one of those who believe that denying the virus, basically. But there is an argument to be made that the health infrastructure is not just uh, in shambles, but it is, it has collapsed. We have reports that stated that there have been repeated attacks on hospitals alone, that there isn't enough to treat previous outbreaks of cholera and other viruses, and that the systems are not equipped to deal with what is happening right now. Given that reality, do you think, can anyone blame those people living in Yemen for not wanting to believe that there is another pandemic at stake here, that their lives might be even more threatened than they already are? Um, even if there is a collapsed system, if there is no test, here in Sweden they don't do tests. No tests are, uh, have been done. But there is, there is understanding and there is acceptance that there is a, a virus and there are treatment for this virus. Can those hospitals. treatments happen? Can those tre treatments these... happen in Yemen, given the state of affairs? Can they happen with the infrastructure we're talking about? I mean, uh, the world's best health infrastructures, from Europe to the United States, are uh, completely uh, overwhelmed. Can we expect that they would be able to cope with something like this? I mean, we're saying that uh, accepting the virus existing is the first step, and then it'll be treated. But can we give that hope to the people that it will, in fact, be treated? Actually, there is this Heil Group initiative, which is a private sector initiative that uh, created an international fund, and they have pre they are sending 350 ventilators. There is a need for uh, there is at at this moment in Yemen, the whole country, there are only 200 ventilators. 
there is a need for extra ventilators. There will be coming 350 ventilators along with PCRs and testing uh, equipment, uh, etc. Uh, there is a need for the, the training the health sector, yes, and there is a need for building the, the uh, somehow stopping the conflict so that there is a, a functioning health All right. system. That's true. Right. Mr. Vasi... Uh, Mr. Vasi, just to that point, I want your response there on that point that uh, Ms. Bushra Nasser pointed out, that there are uh, there is equipment on the way. There is an effort being made to halt the conflict within. There are efforts being made to train professionals on the ground. Do you feel like that will be enough? Let's put aside whether or not you believe that this virus exists, if there is a virus, if there is something like cholera that ha has uh, happened before. How would that impact the population in Yemen? I don't think it would impact the, the population of Yemen. And the major thing impacting the population of Yemen is the war that is going on in Yemen. The, the attacks on Yemen, the blockades on Yemen, this is impacting Yemen. In terms of viruses, sicknesses, things like this, we have an immune system that the Creator has given us for a purpose, to fight off viruses. 99% of these people who are coronavirus victims or who die in the hospital, it is because they have compromised immune systems weakened immune systems. So if you want to fight off any virus, boost in your immunity. Boost, uh, boost in your levels of vitamin C. Right, but, uh, but the fact that they, uh, but people in Yemen are extremely malnourished uh, and their immunity will and is probably compromised due to that, how can you say that they would be able to fight off the virus if it did come sure, to them? You have, people, you have people in Yemen, Yemen. you have Yemenis who survived mal malaria. You have Yemenis who survived, survived many things in terms of um, illnesses related to the immune system, right? And you know how many Yemenis go through malaria cases on a yearly basis, on a daily basis, on a monthly basis, and they survive? So they have immune systems that are functioning properly and correctly. That's not an issue, yeah? The issue is, are we going to give validity, are we going to give credibility to um, this supposed uh, pandemic that is going around that seems to be pushed as an agenda? by a certain person named Bill Gates, who's the founder of computer software, and now he's in the medical field, even though he has zero credentials and zero qualifications in, me in medical field All or right. medicine, but he is one of the main... All right, Ms. Abushan Nasser, now there's a widespread malnourishment uh, in Yemen. There are cases of hunger. The country is on the brink of uh, famine. And you are talking about the fact that there might be more ventilators coming in, but there is a population of 29 million people. Will all those supplies be enough? Exactly. There's an economic crisis and a health crisis going along together, plus the conflict. So, And then we have floods in Yemen as well that took place in the last couple of weeks that bring, brought more uh, new diseases and the new kind of viruses uh, uh, on the surface. I'm not a health, a health expert, but uh, I think it's typhoid and uh, another kind of uh, fever that's very similar to, uh, to COVID-19. As I, as I, I see, the, it's, it's a tsunami coming into Yemen. Now that there are some cases happening in the south that have been reported, we are looking for to hear from what's going to happen in Sana'a. But there is an outbreak, outbreak coming in. And that if this happens, then there is a tsunami that the country is going to uh, be going through without having the minimum economic and health uh, infrastructure to, to combat it. I'm talking about a country that is uh, dysfunctional and fragmented institutions, state institutions, significant uh, damage in the public infrastructure and a lack of security, uh, drop oil uh, expenditure, uh, uh, exportation, sorry, and, and remittance. Even uh, humanitarian aid in Yemen has uh, remittance for Yemenis is the only thing that kept Yemenis not dying from starvation. This is by report, $3.2 billion was the remittance of Yemenis to Yemen last year. And this is triple the amount of the humanitarian aid sent to Yemen. Ms. That was, Abushan, as, uh... as, 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 as mid mentioned, if I may say, as it has been mentioned by the uh, uh, panel of experts, as it was a paralyzed humanitarian aid effort, and that has been in the report, stating the report. So that the humanitarian aid functioning 
was not the, that kept people alive. The, the, the thing that kept people alive in Yemen are remittance. And now there is a shortage in remittance because most of the people working around Yemen and, the, and outside of Yemen are out, are in quarantine. They cannot send money back to the uh, uh, people. Ms. Uh, Bushra Nasser, since I'm time, I just want to put this one uh, last question to you. Given that the worst case scenario, if there is an outbreak within Yemen, most people understand that it will be one of the worst humanitarian crises uh, in modern times, given everything that is happening. Do you think that there is an understanding of that on the international community's front when they talk about uh, humanitarian aid, when they talk about trying to cease conflict? Unfortunately, no, because there is a drop in the aid and support. The, the support shouldn't have been stopped or dropped. The U.S. stopped aid to Yemen. Uh, there is a, sh a drop in the aid uh, from the international community. This is not supposed to be happening. What is supposed to be happening is uh, uh, fixing the, the, the problems, fixing and, and uh, uh, finding a way to make the uh, paralyzed humanitarian aid system efforts working. And at this moment, what, I, what, what, do I, what we hope is that the international community and the Yemeni community, the private sector Yemeni community, who are living in the neighboring countries and they are rich uh, people, support Yemen. We should be unifying our efforts because what is happening now, what I, how I'm seeing it, I agree that immunity should be boosted. But what kind of immunity the people will have if they are malnourished and needing food, if they are not able to stay home for right. quarantine when they are uh, depending on daily wages? 85% uh, right. of the micro and small enterprise depends on the daily wages. If we have, like, uh, no uh, security on the ground, forcing them to stay home even, right. or social distancing... And there is no food and there is no medicine getting into the country because of the conflict. These, these are catastrophic, catastrophic scenarios. Right. On that point, we're going to have to end the show. Thank you so much, Ms. Bushra Nasser, for joining us. Nabil Vasi for joining us from Yemen. Thank you for watching in the special. We will see you again tomorrow with more stories. Till then, goodbye and take care.